To fully understand a group G, you need to take it apart and study the piece. The piece is called subgroup. There are small group contained in G. But where do you begin to look for subgroup? How do you find them if there are any? By using object called corset, we can using object called corset, we can create a simple rules that dramatically narrow down the possible list of subgroup. The result is called language theorem. Today, we will prove this theorem and show how useful it can be. Quick note for the rest of this video, we will be only talking about finite group. A subgroup of a group G a subset that also a group if H is a subgroup of G. We write it like this. Every group has at least two subgroups itself and the trivial group. The trivial group consists of a single element, the identify element. This is similar to how every positive integer has at least two divisor itself and one. But this subgroup is fairly dull. We want to see if G has, has a subgroup other than this to something more interesting. The mathematician uh, Joseph Lewis uh, Langridge found a useful test which is we now call it uh, language theorem he discovered that if h is a subgroup of a finite group g then the order of g h divide the order of g recall that the order of a group is a number of element in the group and it's denoted by the absolute value symbol with this notation we can write the language theorem more completely this a powerful result is say that subgroup cannot be any old side there are strong restriction on the possible subgroup of G. Before proving this theorem, let's see just how useful this is. Imagine you have a group uh, G with 323 elements. You can factor this as 17 times uh, 19. Uh, this means the only positive integer dividing 323 are 1, 17, 19, and 323. So any subgroup of G must have an order 1, 17, 19, or 323. Then we mentioned that every group has at least two subgroups itself and the travel group. The group itself has order 323 and the travel group has order 1. This means it's G as any other subgroups, their order are 17 or 19. This list is suspect has shortened dramatically. This is a good moment to pause and not get overly excited about language theorem. We need to learn its limitation 17 and 19 divide the order of G. Does language theorem say that uh, they are subgroup of this order? No, language theorem is an if they then a theorem which mean the converse or may not be true. Okay. Just because a number divide the order of G, then no guarantee that a subgroup of this size will exist. In the case, it just so happened that G does have subgroup of order 17 and 19, but they are a group where is uh, where this is not the case. Let S be a set and a covenant relation on S is a relation covenant on S satisfying the following three properties. Number one is reflexivity. A is equivalent to A for all A uh, element of S. Number two, symmetry. If A, B element of S and A is equivalent to B, then B is equivalent to A. Number three, transitivity. If A, B and C element of S with A is equivalent to B, and B is equivalent to C, then A is equivalent to C. Going to equivalence relation, just a visual. Example, partition G into H by equivalent relation, uh, same size and do not overlap. An equivalence relation is a way of pairing off element of S by equivalence, which S will be a set. The whole point of introducing equivalence relations is to obtain a method of partitioning a group. Some of the subset of S determined by an equivalence relation. Let us go to the next slide. In the example, define equivalence R by A is equivalent to B if A equals to B. In reflexivity, for any A is an element of R, A equals to A. So, A is an equivalent to A. In symmetry, if A and B is an element of R, A equals to B, then B equals to A. So that A is an equivalent to B. In place, 
B is an equivalence to A. Intransitive, if A, B, and C is an element of R with A equals to B and B equals to C, then A equals to C. However, Grunge's theorem also has some limitation. Let's take a look at the previous example. In the example, does the Grunge's theorem mention that there are subgroup of order 17 and 19? No. Grunge's theorem is if h e s less than or equal to g, then the order of h e s divides the order of g. In other words, the Grunge's theorem is if then theorem. This means that the converse may not be true. In this example, G does have a subgroup of order 17 and 19, but it may not apply to others. Good evening, uh, Dr. Nasri. So this is my part for the presentation of Lagrange's theorem. So I will be talking in detail about c o s e t s So this is somewhat related to equivalence relations that we talked about earlier. But in this case, so let me, uh, let me talk about it. So let G be a group and H a subgroup of G. For any X in G, we let X H denote the set of all products X H as X remains fixed and H ranges over H. Don't worry. If you're confused about this, we will get into it in detail in a moment with examples. Okay. So if the X H is Uh, sorry, if the x is on this side and h is on this side, we say that xh is a left coset of h in g. So just take note of this. So if x is an uh, element of g, so if the x is on this side, on the left side of h, we say that for xh, uh, for every h is an element of h, so therefore it is a left coset of h in g. And it's the same for if when the x is on the right side of h, we will say that hx, uh, h an element of x is element of h, uh, small h is an element of big h is a right coset of h in g. So therefore, we can conclude that every coset in g is a subset of g. For example, so this is a very simple example here. So let's say we have this group where this is the addition of integer mod 4, and we have the h here, 0 and 2. Right. Okay. So for the integer mod 4, this is the numbers that we have inside, the integers that we have 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay. So let's say that I would like to add h. Okay. So let's say h. h is 0 and 2, right? Okay. So let's say I would like to add 1. Okay. I would like to add 1. This is called the right coset. The right coset. So let's say I would add 1. as a right coset into h. So what happens? 1 plus 0 is 1, 2 plus 1 is 3. Okay, then next, what if I add 3 into h as a right coset? Then I will get 3 plus 0 equal 3, and 3 plus 2 equal 5, but it is mod 4. Therefore, we would write 1 here instead. Okay, so clear on this. Next, this is an example. If we want to say it's left coset where we add 2, on the left here into h. So when 2 plus 0, we get 2. But when 2 plus 2, we get 4. Mod 4, we get 0. Right. And 0 plus h, okay, 0 plus h, left coset. And 0 plus 0 is 0. And h plus 2 is 2. Okay, there's something I would like to mention here. So as we can see here, as previously you learned about equivalence relations, Uh, not evaluations. Uh, so now I would like to say that. Now please take a look here. Okay, take a look here. Okay, as you can see that these two, they have no similar numbers. This is 3, 1 and this is 2, 0. Typically, we will call this disjoints. Okay, we will say this is a disjoint. That means it has partition. That means it's not together. Okay, it's partitioned. A okay? partition uh, in the definition of partition is uh, is separated. Okay. All right. So therefore, we can conclude that typically, uh, it's not this not coincidence because we can conclude that the cosets H A as a range over G is a partition of G. So G H equal to H A. For A is an element of 
G. Simple as that. Okay, next. So I would like to prove the above statements. Okay, so let me get it. So let G be a group and H be a subset of G. The family of all cosets H A as a range over G is a partition of G. Let's say I have this diagram here where I have all this partition H A, H E, H C, and H B. All right. So to prove the above statements, let's take two cosets. Okay, let's take two cosets. We get H A and H B. So we must show that H A intersect H B is equal to a null set or H A is equal to H B. But in this case, we can say that H A intersect H B is not a null set because there is an overlap. Therefore, let's prove that H A is equal to H B. Okay, let's say that H A is equal to H B. Okay, so x equal to h1a and x equal to h2b. Alright, then as you can see here, I proceed to the next step where I say a is equal to h1 inverse. h1 inverse equal to h1 inverse h2b. Okay. H1 inverse H2B. Oh, sorry, for X here. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we could say that the reason why I have inverse here is because uh, I can have an inverse here. Okay, uh, there's the commutative and so on. It's something that we have learned previous in previous chapters. Okay, so I just want you to focus here. The reason why I can conclude that H A is equal to H B is because due to this, all right, because H inverse H is some element of big H, we can say that A is an element of H B, is some element of H B. Because A is some element of H B, we can conclude that H A is equal to H B. Okay.